Good evening and welcome. Concordia College is singularly honored to again host the Jacobson Global Lecture and we are uh, delighted to be joined today by uh, the wife formerly of the esteemed person after whom this lecture series is named, uh, Kate Kors Jacobson, who is more than a benefactor but is a robust participant in the activities of this lecture series. Can you join me in thanking her for her presence and participation? Thank you. There are many words in your um, lovely folder. The paper, the quality of the paper is excellent, isn't it? Yeah. And the words tell you everything you need to know about the accomplishments, scholarly achievements, the activism in communities, and the uh, family connections of our speaker. But I'd like to just fill in a few of the blanks, if I may, because I consider Heath Carter a friend. Indeed, he is a scholar. Um, he taught a class at Valparaiso University called the History of Hip Hop. And I think students, when they signed up for that class, in fact, so many signed up that they had to close the section and open another section because of the great demand for his uh, teaching. But I'm sure the students maybe thought one thing, that they were going to get a class on just kind of rhythm and rhyming and rapping. And instead of that, they got a class on ethnomusicology, sociology, cultural studies, rhetoric, urban studies, and of course, the social history of the United States of America. I was scheduled uh, four years ago to co-lecture with Martin Marty, who is, uh, I know, known to you, Catherine Galschut. He is probably the preeminent uh, religious historian in the United States of America. I was paired up with him somehow, and he became ill approximately a week before the lecture series. Everyone signed up to hear him. And so they were looking for a replacement. At the last minute, I asked Heath Carter if he could please step in. And after Heath Carter was done, nobody thought about Martin Marty again. <laughs> he had a great week at Camp Arcadia. What I like most about Heath, however, is the way he puts his scholarly work to work on the streets with activism. Uh, Heath was very involved, and I stood in awe of him as he led in Valparaiso, Univer in Valparaiso Indiana, when he was, since he's at the university there, a, um, a very troubling police stop that went bad, and there was behavior that was bad on each side, a young African-American male. He felt he was stopped without reason or cause. A white police officer who felt that he had been insulted and offended by this young man. And the community was in an uproar on both sides. The law and order people were angry. Uh, the minority community and those who support minority rights were angry. And he stepped into the middle of the fray. And he negotiated and navigated that tempestuous situation with the result that there was an apology from the young Afri African American male for uh, his conduct that day. And the entire Porter County Police Department agreed to undergo anti-bias training, which is really unprecedented in the state of Indiana. Uh, and this is Heath's leadership, putting his scholarly work to action in activism. When I uh, was approached about becoming president here, I reached out to Heath as a friend. He was one of the first people I reached out to. And he was incredibly encouraging and supportive and prayerful uh, as I deliberated that decision. So Heath, I'm delighted that you're one of the first people I've invited to campus to my new beloved home here in Bronxville. Thank you so much, brother. Well, thank you very much, John, for that incredibly generous introduction and for the invitation to be here. It is wonderful to be here tonight and I also want to thank of course Ms. Jacobson and the late Dr. Jacobson for funding this lecture and, and I'm amazed and honored to be a part of the list of speakers that you have in your 
your program tonight. Uh, I also want to thank Joyce Kennedy and Avery Davis who have done so much to make this visit possible and I really appreciate it. I know that work often goes uh, unnoticed. So yeah, let's give them a round of applause. I think it's a really opportune moment for the theme of this year's Jacobson Lecture, uh, Reformation. You may know, of course, that this is a historic moment uh, as the world paused yesterday to reflect on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Um, so obviously uh, opportune in that sense, but I think also um, opportune theme in the sense that today, in today's world, right now, um, I believe there is a hunger for reformation, religious and otherwise. Um, so I'm delighted to be here tonight and to think about the meanings of reformation with you, um, both past and present across time and across the world, uh, across the globe. So without further ado, here we go. Imagine a world in crisis, one in which natural disasters Flooding and fires, severe winters and prolonged droughts are producing widespread famine and displacement. One in which disease is outrunning all human efforts at containment. It's a world shaped not only by the fickleness of Mother Nature, but also by the fallenness of human beings. Entire nations torn apart by unspeakably violent wars. New industries producing both unprecedented wealth and unprecedented inequality, even as respected voices blame the persistence of poverty on the poor. New technologies generating at once increased access to knowledge and deeper deficits in understanding. It's a world in which the most serious crises have to do with values, and one in which the Christian churches appear powerless to intervene, having become so worldly in their own right that they have lost their way not to mention the trust of the faithful. Can you imagine a world like this? If so, you've got an inkling of the wider context in which 500 years and one day ago, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg. Luther's initial concern was with the sale of indulgences, assurances that in return for payment, penalties for sin would be remitted offering the possibility that a living or dead soul could avoid purgatory. But what began as a relatively minor theological controversy grew into a movement that not only irrevocably changed the shape of global Christianity, but also helped give birth to the modern world. I cannot stress enough how improbable it is that in 2017 we would remember Luther and the Reformation he started. In 1517, he was a 30-something Augustinian monk who had published nothing and was teaching at a new, no-name university, which Luther himself admitted was situated in termino civilitatis, on the edge of civilization. You can get a sense of that from this contemporary illustration. Wittenberg was, to put it in more familiar terms, nowheresville. When Luther arrived, it counted only some 2,000 persons. Germany's great cities boasted 30 times that many. Luther's opponents never failed to underscore the inauspicious context out of which his ideas emerged. One described Wittenberg as a miserable, poor, dirty village in comparison to Prague hardly worth three farthings. Yes, in fact, it is not worthy to be called a town of Germany. It has an unhealthy, disagreeable climate. It is without vineyards, orchards, or fruit-bearing trees of any kind. Dirty homes, unclean alleys, all roads, paths, and streets are full of filth. It has a barbarous people who make their living from breweries and saloons, and a body of merchants not worth three cents. If the upshot of that description wasn't clear enough, another naysayer drove to the heart of the matter that a single monk out of such a hole could undertake a reformation is not to be tolerated. And even today there remain critics, aplenty of course. Five years ago, University of Notre Dame historian Brad Gregory published an erudite and provocative book 
The Unintended Reformation, How a Religious Revolution Secularized Society, in which he argued that the most serious crises facing our world today, including everything from political polarization to moral relativism and from runaway consumerism to climate change, have a single origin in the Reformation, and in particular in the doctrine of sola scriptura. So long as the church acted as the final arbiter of scriptural interpretation and right teaching, Gregory contends, it was possible for Christian societies to have a unitary sense of the true, the good, the beautiful, and the just. The reformers' insistence on the Bible alone, combined with their inability to agree about what the Bible alone actually had to say, dealt a death blow to this consensus. And in its place emerged the radical pluralism that's characteristic of our world today, and which precludes decisive action for the common good, in part because we have no shared sense of what the good is, or if it even exists, let alone how to achieve it. We should not too lightly brush aside such concerns. But this evening, I want to come at this theme of reformation from a somewhat different, and I think more hopeful, angle. I want to argue that while the movement Luther started was in many ways singular, Reformation is in fact a much broader pattern in the history of Christianity. One with roots reaching back to first century Bethlehem and with branches extending across the globe still in the 21st century. What do I mean by this? Christians have always believed that God works in and through the institutions of the church. But history underscores that these institutions can also, at least for a time, lose their way, becoming conformed to the world and caught up in injustice. In such times, the churches need to be called back to the gospel, or one might even say, called back to themselves. Thus, the wisdom of the ancient saying, often attributed to Augustine and later championed within the Reformed traditions, ecclesia semper reformanda est. The church must always be reformed. Reformation is not a one-time event. It is an ongoing process. Tonight I'll contend that in the Christian past, reformations have consistently emerged not from the places and the people you might expect, but rather from everyday people in ordinary places. As we will see, the case of an obscure monk in lowly Wittenberg illustrates a much larger trend. The accelerant of reform in 16th century Germany, of course, was Luther's momentous decision to translate the Bible into German. And this, too, captures a greater reality that when the faith is translated into the language of the faithful, something powerful happens. The believer would say, the spirit moves. With the remainder of my time tonight, I want to explore these dynamics of church and spirit as they've played out across time and across the globe. Hold tight. Before we're done, we'll make our way across some five centuries and four continents but I want to start much closer to home. As I suggested a moment ago, if the medieval Catholic Church had in some significant senses lost its way, it is hardly alone in the history of Christianity. Throughout the 16th century, even as Europe was consumed with theological controversy, the pace of European exploration across the seas quickened. Just 19 years after the death of Martin Luther, the Spanish founded St. Augustine, Florida, and 42 years after that, the English established their first permanent settlement in Jamestown, Virginia. By the end of the 17th century, the colonization of the Atlantic seaboard was nearly complete. Now, the popular perception is often that back in the day, people were much more religious, and that the earliest European settlers of North America were deeply pious people fleeing persecution. The reality is that outside of Puritan New England and some scattered Quaker and Anabaptist communities in the Mid-Atlantic, the colonies were anything but model Christian societies. The first settlers were often swashbuckling, promiscuous, profiteering young men, 
eager to escape Christendom's moral confines. Decades passed before the European churches figured out how to move sufficient personnel and resources across the Atlantic in order to begin restoring some semblance of moral order. With that process still in motion, the Christian churches of the New World consolidated their strength in part by sanctifying a brutal trade in human lives. The rise of black chattel slavery was not inevitable. In fact, we know that the first workers in southern fields were European indentured servants. Early plantation owners also tried to put the New World's native peoples to work. But neither of these options proved economically efficient for a variety of reasons, including especially a susceptibility to disease carried over from the old world, Native Americans tended to die off and so were not a dependable labor force. Indentured servants had short lifespans as well and proved unreliable for other reasons besides. They came to the new world with high hopes and when these were disappointed, they quickly grew restless. The essential problem was that they had hoped, after their period of indenture, to have land of their own to work. But in Virginia, for example, a small number of very wealthy plantation owners quickly claimed the best land. In 1676, a rebellion of common farmers, Bacon's Rebellion, left the planter class shaken and looking for other options. They found a convenient one in enslaved West Africans who were durable, available, and best of all, unlike the indentured class, never had to be set free. The decision to transition to enslaved labor was motivated by the intoxicating promise of profits and political stability, not by the fact that these West Africans had a different color skin. That promise of profits, of course, bound up in the triangle trade, which you see illustrated here. The planters immediately confronted two logistical problems with enslaved labor. One, because they would never be free, enslaved laborers had little incentive to work. The planters did the best they could to create one, passing laws that sanctioned violence in order to extract labor. One 1669 law, an act about the casual killing of slaves, gave masters every assurance that if a slave should happen to die in the course of being punished, the punisher would not be held legally responsible. One gruesome court record reveals that in 1707, the law was invoked, giving a planter, quote, full power according to law to dismember two incorrigible Negroes, Bambara Hari and Dina. The threat and use of violence to keep black people in their place, quote unquote, emerged within years of West Africans' arrival in the New World, and that threat would not soon go away. But there was a second problem. For a number of years, West Africans worked in the fields alongside European indentured servants. Often we forget this moment. The planters, interestingly, did not assume that the European indentured class was racist. Rather, the planters were absolutely terrified of the possibility of an underclass alliance and cultivated what? Racism in order to prevent it. Across the colonies, legislatures passed laws designed to foster contempt for the enslaved. They empowered masters to apply 30 lashes to the bare back of any enslaved person who, quote, shall presume to lift up his hand in opposition against any Christian, unquote. The term Christian was understood to include European indentured servants, but not West African slaves. We'll come back to that in just a moment. The laws at the same time forbade masters from whipping, quote, a Christian white servant naked without an order from a justice of the peace. This inscribed a distinction between Europeans and Africans into law. Similarly, legislatures protected servants' property while confiscating that which belonged to slaves. Most importantly, they criminalized interracial relationships. In Virginia, whites who married slaves were banished from the colony. 
Ministers who presided at any such marriage were to be fined 10,000 pounds of tobacco. Within a matter of few short decades, slavery had given birth to a deeply entrenched and legally sanctioned racism, what historians often call America's original sin. So what do the churches have to say about all of this? The truth is that the vast majority of Christians in the New World raised their voices against neither slavery nor the racist legal regime that accompanied it. Within the churches themselves, many colonists felt, excuse me, expressed reticence about slave baptism and conversion because they feared that once they became Christian, slaves would have to be released. There was a long-standing English Association of Christianity and Freedom which itself extended back to the Reformation and Luther's notion of the freedom of a Christian. In light of these fears, many colonial legislatures passed laws clarifying that baptism would not produce freedom for the enslaved. The Virginia Assembly in 1699 went so far as to resolve that, quote, the gross barbarity and rudeness of slaves' manners, the variety and strangeness of their languages, and the weakness and shallowness of their minds made conversion itself impossible. Of course, many slaveholders were not themselves Christian. Christian practice, as I mentioned before, was at best lethargic throughout many of the colonies, and especially the South in the late 18th, 17th and early 18th centuries. Church was a social club, which the rich attended not for spiritual nourishment, but rather to maintain their status. Nonetheless, they clearly experienced guilt about slaveholding, denying in public that it was vicious, mean, or cruel, claiming that their own slaves were well-fed and well-treated, even as they avoided slaves in situations that might provoke guilt, like the communion table. One slaveholder, quote, resolved never to come to the holy table while slaves are received. Another worried, if any of my slaves go to heaven, must I see them there? As the number of clergy in the southern colonies grew at the end of the 17th century, and with the founding of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts in 1701, the mission to slaves gained a powerful institutional advocate. But missionaries, too, taught a distinction between the enslaved and the free. One popular text taught that the, quote, commands of God precede the law of the land and or the will of the master in the case of everyone except slaves who were not like servants. To the slaves and captives, Paul would say, obey your master in all things as becomes your sad condition and make your chains as easy as you can by your compliance and submission. It was an understanding of slavery that fit perfectly with the developing slave codes of the time, and so Christians not only ratified the law, but helped to shape it. There's no doubt that early Christian missions to slaves reflected an earnest desire to save their souls, but they also became a means of deepening and extending the slave system. One South Carolina minister required slaves to repeat this oath in front of their masters before he would baptize them, quote, that you do not ask for the holy baptism out of any design to free yourself from the duty and obedience you owe to your master while you live." Unquote. Churches lost their way indeed. I don't have time to narrate the whole awful tale today, but suffice it to say that this is the beginning of one of the longest running, most significant, and most devastating story arcs in the history of American Christianity one whose legacies remain palpable in our national life even today. Namely, the historical process by which white Christian churches became not incidentally, not peripherally, but rather centrally involved in the construction and maintenance of white supremacist social and political regimes. This has never been true to a person or to a congregation, of course, but it has nevertheless been broadly true, and far more than popular memory typically allows. The notion that there was vast white Christian involvement in abolition and the civil rights movement simply does not correspond to history. While white believers have often imagined the United States as a new Israel 
a light unto the world. It's not hard to understand why, as historian Albert Rabateau has argued, African Americans found it to be a new Egypt. In Malcolm X's memorable turn of phrase, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. And yet, there is another story to be told. A story about how enslaved African Americans found in the Bible, a Bible which was given to them in the interests of securing their obedience, not only the strength to persevere, but also the courage to resist. Even while in bondage and often denied opportunities to learn to read or write, black believers evangelized by the master class with its culturally captive faith, nevertheless had the eyes to see and the ears to hear the true gospel. In hush harbors far removed from the big house, enslaved persons gathered to praise and worship a God who created them as full human beings in his very image. A crucified God who knew suffering and who stood with them in the midst of theirs. A God who had led the Israelites out of Egypt, who proclaimed liberty to the captives, and who longed for them, yes, for them to be free. The racial reformation of American Christianity and of American national life did not begin in gilded downtown cathedrals. It did not begin at the White House. It began in the slave quarters. And it began among persons so despised that they were not even counted as persons by the founding fathers who drafted the original Constitution of the United States of America. This reformation advanced in fits and starts, confronted at every turn by concerted opposition, sometimes explicit and violent, sometimes subtle and concealed. But advance it did through the courageous witness of ordinary persons who answered God's call to do extraordinary things. Persons like Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, who when told in 1792 that they could not kneel in prayer alongside their white brothers and sisters at Philadelphia's St. George's Methodist Church, completed their prayers and then walked right out of that church. They went on to found some of the first independent black institutions in these United States. This reformation advanced through the witness of women such as Jarena Lee and Sojourner Truth, whose encounters with God in the midst of their everyday lives emboldened them to take uncompromising stands for the dignity of black women in a society that consistently devalued and degraded their humanity. I could hardly begin to do justice this evening to the great cloud of witnesses whose faith propelled them into the centuries-long black freedom struggle. But it is All Saints Day. <laughs> Had I more time, I would tell stories of Ida B. Wells and Henry McNeil Turner, of Ressy Taylor and Howard Thurman, of Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin Luther King Jr., and many more besides. Needless to say, their sacrifices did, over the course of time, begin to reform both church and nation. Historians argue that the prophetic faith of black civil rights activists steeled a mighty mass movement in ways that the optimistic liberalism of many white reformers could not and did not. While many white reformers underestimated the power of evil, African Americans knew that it was real and formidable. They had long experienced it firsthand. And yet they also knew a savior who had taken up his cross, a resurrected savior, whose victory over death and oppression empowered them to pick up their crosses in the hope that a day was coming, and soon, when they would indeed overcome. This faith strengthened them to endure even the most devastating setbacks. And there were many. At the funeral of Martin Luther King, 
James Bevel preached, and I quote, There's a false rumor around that our leader's dead. Our leader is not dead. Martin Luther King is not our leader. There was some hesitation from the crowd at this moment. It had been crying aloud, talk it, in response to Bevel's words. But he went on. Our leader is the man who led Moses out of Israel. That's the man, the crowd exclaimed. Our leader is the man who went with Daniel into the lion's den. Same man. Our leader is the man who walked out of the grave on Easter morning. Our leader never sleeps nor stumbles. He cannot be put in jail. He has never lost a war yet. Our leader is still on the case. Our leader is not died. On One of his prophets died, and we will not stop because of that. This remarkable, spirit-formed, reformation-powering faith continues to propel struggles for racial justice today. That fight is far from over, but already it has changed the course of history, not only here in the United States, but also around the world. Consider what happened when Dietrich Bonhoeffer came to New York City. This is him shortly thereafter. The German Lutheran pastor and theologian arrived in this corner of the world in 1930 as a Sloan Fellow at Union Theological Seminary. Up to that point, Bonhoeffer, just 24 years old, had demonstrated strong sympathy for his homeland's theological mainstream, which, contra the spirit of Martin Luther's teaching, often more or less equated being a good Christian with being a patriotic German. The year before his arrival in the United States, Bonhoeffer had gone so far as to, to declare, quote, it is simply not possible to love, or as the case may be, to protect both my enemy and my people, or my Volk. In later years, when the Third Reich seized on this latent preference for the German Volk and turned it into a demonic genocidal ideology, Bonhoeffer resisted. What inoculated him against this virulent disease? In an important book entitled Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus, ethicist Reggie Williams argues that it was certainly not Union Theological Seminary, where he found a vague and unappealing Protestant liberalism. Bonhoeffer memorably reflected, quote, in New York they preach about virtually everything. Only one thing is not addressed, or is addressed so rarely that I have as yet been able to hear it namely the gospel of Jesus Christ. The cross, sin and forgiveness, death and life. It was not Union, but rather Harlem that changed him. In particular, it was Bonhoeffer's friendship with a black man by the name of Albert Fisher, the son of Charles Fisher, one of the founding pastors of Birmingham, Alabama's 16th Street Baptist Church which you may know as the site of an infamous 1963 bombing that took the lives of four girls attending Sunday school. Fisher was steeped in a prophetic black Christian faith and brought Bonhoeffer along with him to Harlem's Abyssinian Baptist Church, founded in 1808 by a small group of 12 black women and four black men who refused to accept segregated seating in New York City's first Baptist church. At Abyssinian, the young German encountered a vein of preaching and song that magnified a Jesus who suffered in solidarity with the marginalized. Bonhoeffer would later write that it was through these experiences in Harlem that he truly became a Christian. And the implications for his social witness were profound. Williams writes, Upon his return to, to Germany, Bonhoeffer entered the context of the poor and the outcasts and the slums of Berlin with the tradition of Jesus he encountered in Harlem. Even moving into a poor East Berlin neighborhood as a renter and seeking to make his time there permanent as a pastor within their community. And in the church struggle, he entered into the context of those marginalized by the Nazi government seeking to make his companions aware of the view of the oppressive German society from the perspective of those suffering and marginalized within it. Most German Lutherans did not stand in the way of Hitler. Bonhoeffer did, at least in part because during his time in Harlem, 
his faith had been reformed. We can find parallel reformations across the world, including, for example, in colonial Africa. Late 19th and early 20th century colonizers often drew on a perverse and profoundly racist theological imaginary which reframed the empire as a benevolent force through which the, quote, civilized nations could bring light and truth to the, quote, savage races of the world. Take up the white man's burden, the British poet Rudyard Kipling famously exhorted in one 1899 poem. At their worst, Christian missions to Africa's indigenous peoples were, in the words of one leading scholar, colonialism at prayer. But the story doesn't end there. Just as American plantation owners got more than they bargained for when they passed the Bible along to the enslaved, so too did modern empires. Consider what happened in Kenya when British missionaries translated the scriptures into Gikuyu, the language of that nation's largest ethnic group. As Kenyans read the Bible for themselves, it became apparent almost immediately that it belonged as much to them as it did to the British. And so, not surprisingly, Christianly infused movements for independence began to sprout. Laman Sana, one of the foremost historians of world Christianity, explains the fact that the Gikuyu Bible contains stories of slavery and freedom, captivity and liberation, exile and homecoming, death and resurrection, made it a primer for the decolonization campaign and a godsend for nationalist aspirations. The Watu Wamungu, the people of God, were just one example. The colonial administration considered the group and its leaders to be false prophets. Their teachings, however, were profoundly infused with biblical perspective. So far as they could tell, the God of the Bible, whom they called Moene Niaga, was the God of their history. And just as God had rescued the Israelites from Pharaoh, so would he deliver them from the clutches of colonial rule. The Watuwa Mungu were brutally suppressed in 1934. But as Sana points out, the colonial system did not survive the forces that they had activated. Across nations and continents, this same pattern has played out time and time again. As the gospel of colonization has given way to waves of indigenous-led reformation, and just as in 16th century Germany, these movements have thrived especially in those places where the Bible has been translated into the vernacular, the language of the people. One African Christian holding a translated gospel in his hands for the first time declared, here is a document which proves that we also are human beings, the first and only book in our language. Another reflected, I know that in my body I am a very little man, but today as I see the whole Bible in my language, I feel as big as a mountain. In the wake of mid-century decolonization, a growing number of missionaries, belatedly perceiving the vital connection between the indigenization of Christianity and the evangelization of the world, devoted themselves to the work of translation, and not just of the Bible, but of other Christian forms as well. One of the most striking examples of this is the Maasai Creed, developed collaboratively by missionaries and the Maasai people in 1960. It reads as follows, and I've put it up here. I don't know if you can, how well you can see that, but I'll read it for you. We believe in the one high God who, out of love, created the beautiful world and everything good in it. He created man and wanted man to be happy in the world. God loves the world and every nation and tribe on the earth. We have known this high God in darkness and now we know him in the light. God promised in the book of his word, the Bible, that he would save the world and all the nations and tribes. We believe that God made good his promise by sending his son, Jesus Christ, a man in the flesh, a Jew by tribe, born poor in a little village, who left his home and was always on safari doing good, curing people by the power of God, 
teaching about God and man, showing the meaning of religion is love. He was rejected by his people, tortured and nailed hands and feet to a cross and died. He lay buried in the grave, but the hyenas did not touch him. And on the third day he rose from the grave. He ascended to the skies. He is the Lord. We believe that all our sins are forgiven through him. All who have faith in him must be sorry for their sins, be baptized in the Holy Spirit of God, live the rules of love, and share the bread together in love to announce the good news to others until Jesus comes again. We are waiting for him. He is alive. He lives. This we believe. Amen. It was a reformulation of the Apostles' Creed that reflected Reformation. Indeed, major changes in the methodology and practice of Christian missions. Changes driven not by elite church administrators, but rather by ordinary believers in many places you and I have never even heard of. The story of Christianity and colonialism in Africa is a complicated one. But it leaves no doubt, as Sana puts it, that, quote, the Missio Dei could not be held hostage to Europe's rule of cultural assimilation. And what was true in mid-20th century Africa is true across the globe today. The shape of world Christianity is changing at a breathtaking pace, and its central hubs, long Europe and North America, are moving south. You can see an indication of that in this uh, chart here today, the way that it's changed over just the last hundred years. Nigeria today has twice as many Protestants as Germany, once the beating heart of the Protestant Reformation. Latin America, which boasted only 60 million identified Christians in 1900, now has more than 550 million believers, nearly one quarter of the world's total. It is nearly impossible to generalize about the substance of faith in these far-flung places, but there can be no doubt that explosive growth continues to track, as it has for the last 500 years, with the translation of the Bible into the languages of the faithful. Consider Christianity's surging presence in Asia today. When Mongolia's communist regime collapsed in 1990, there were not even 10 professing Christians in the entire country. Today, there are more than 50,000. In Korea, the translation of the Bible into Hangul has produced electrifying results, boosting literacy, cultural arts, and national pride. It's almost certain that last Sunday, more people attended this church, the Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, South Korea, then attended all of the churches in many a major North American denomination. All signs point to similar developments in China, which experts predict by 2030 will be home to more Christians than any other country on earth. You can see the trend here. One former government analyst writes, you can no longer say that Christianity is a foreign religion. The churches are led by Chinese. You see Chinese Bibles. You hear Chinese worship songs. You experience a Chinese style of worship. The church looks and feels Chinese. Christianity has finally taken root in Shenzhou, in China, the land of God. What should we make of these reformations? What do these stories have to do with our lives and our moment? Like Luther 500 years ago, we live in difficult times, at a moment in history that resonates a little too closely with the first stanza of William Butler Yeats's famous poem, The Second Coming. If you don't know it, it reads like this. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Yeats wrote the poem in the wake of the First World War. Chinua Achebe borrowed a line from this poem in his well-known 1958 
novel based on the real life events in Africa during the process of colonization, things fall apart. Today the poem might call to mind places like Myanmar and Syria where brutal atrocities have become part of the everyday routine. But the problems are not just out there. Closer to home, we are living in a moment of historic inequality, of surging ethno-nationalism, of racial strife, and of routine violence punctuated by the all too regular mass shooting. There are serious questions as to whether our shared institutions have the strength to confront these challenges. The well-known conservative analyst and presidential advisor, Peter Weiner, recently lamented the nihilism currently coursing through our politics. Meanwhile, by any number of measures, our churches, too, are faltering. In a five-year period from 2007 to 2012, the percentage of Americans who identify as Christian fell from 78% to 73%. That was in five years, 5%. While the ranks of the unaffiliated, the nuns, that's N-O-N-E-S, as they have come to be known, swelled from 15% to 20% of the total population. You can see the trend of the, the rise of the nuns, as religion scholars call them, on this chart. These declining numbers of religious affiliation reflect, at least in part, serious concerns about the compromised social witness of the institutional churches in our moment. The younger generations, especially the kinds of folks that I interact with on a daily basis, seem to be saying, if that's what Christianity is all about, then I'd rather do brunch on Sunday morning. And yet, if we take the long view, as we have tonight, then I think even now, we may find reason for hope. The world is seemingly always on the cusp of disaster. Churchly institutions, as we've seen, have often ended up, at least for a time, on the wrong side of history. That's true whether we're talking about early modern Germany, the antebellum South, or colonial Africa. But even so, the spirit has continued to move in surprising and unpredictable ways among the faithful. Reformations often come when they're least expected. If this pattern I've traced here tonight holds, then we should train our eyes and ears to look and listen for God's movement in the places and among the people we might least expect. We should prepare our hearts and souls and minds not to wait for great leaders in high places to rescue us, but rather to answer God's call to faithfulness in our time and in our place. The same spirit that brought reformations out of lowly Wittenberg, out of the slave quarters, and out of African villages is at work even today. Will we cooperate with it? If we answer in the affirmative, then the historical journey we've made this night, which reads as a cautionary tale for those invested in the spirit of the age, should give us the confidence to sing and say the very same words that Martin Luther penned all the way back in the 1520s. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. We have had no shortage of mortal ills. We have no shortage of mortal ills today. And yet, may we move forward in faith, knowing, as Luther ends that beloved hymn of the Reformation, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.
I'm happy to take a question or two. I don't know if we have time or, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. As much a question as a comment to thank you for your brilliant presentation. Mm. Excellent. Um, your institution, uh, your University of Valparaiso, yeah. yeah. and your students mm. and your church are, are fortunate to have you associate with them. Uh, yes. Um, thank you very much. Welcome. Could I ask you to comment a little bit on secondary students' preparation? Mm -hmm. um, uh, their introduction and their education their, in history, world history and American history. Yeah. Because when I see them a few years after graduation, yeah. high school graduation, yeah. so much of history, um, a lot of what you, you talked about this evening, mm -hmm. are, are completely new yeah. to, to them. Yeah. Uh, many yeah. white elephants, no one white elephant really, but mm -hmm. lots of white elephants. Yeah. So I'm wondering about this, what your, your yeah. comment is about the state of high school. Yeah. Program. Well, my experience is very similar. Uh, when I, I teach at Valparaiso University, we have wonderful students. Um, but I'm teaching a course right now in the long civil rights movement. Uh, it's a course with a great mix of students and um, in every way, including racially. And my experience has been, I mean, I love teaching that class. It's a big class. Uh, I love teaching it because um, it is a class where you can kind of walk in and surprise the students every day. Um, that's a sad thing in a way because it means that um, both my white students but also even my African American students many times don't know the history that we're traveling through. Um, so I, I mean I suppose as historians we need there to be a little bit of not knowing out there so we can stay in business. but. Uh, I think, you know, it is a problem, and it's an ongoing problem, both for church and society. Um, I believe that for the churches in particular, it's just vital to know our history. Um, I think it's so vital to reflect on, on where we've been if we're to know how we should go forward. Um, so I mean, I think that's part of what my sense of vocation would be, is, is you know, the sense of uh, the joys of raising uh, awareness and knowledge of these kinds of stories among people who may not know them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, indeed. Thank you uh, for your, your presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whenever I hear yeah. uh, the whole notion that somehow the codification of the Bible has been a standard by which uh, reformation has progressed. Yeah. The thing that happens in my brain is faith cometh by hearing. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder whether or not the whole notion of having the Bible in a, in a form mm -hmm. that can be accessed by folks actually derails the Holy Spirit process <laughs> because the intent was that, that it would be heard, yeah. not held. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I wonder yeah. if you're just new mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great point. I would say it's a both and. Um, I mean, the for example, in the, in the the example I gave of uh, enslaved West Africans and then African Americans, um, in many cases, it wasn't necessarily, in the Bible didn't need to be translated in that case, right? It was, it was uh, a, a broader sense of translation, na namely taking uh, a certain rendition of the gospel and a certain rendition of Christianity and sifting through the dross to find the gold of the gospel in that case. And, and in many cases, that is an oral culture, as, as you're rightly pointing out. Um, this argument about the Bible and the translation of the vernacular is one that I think historians of world Christianity have uh, seen as, as important because it's not, it's, it's not only about, I mean, I think the case of, of uh, slaves here in the United States is illustrative of a broader thing. It's not so much about the physical artifact as it is about the, the, the loss of control by one group and the uh, experience of ownership on the part of another. And, and when Christianity becomes owned by, by uh, people, it, it takes on, it comes with power, I think is the, and, and so sometimes that might, in written cultures, mean this translation, uh, literally the translation of the Bible into their language, 
But even beyond, even much more broader than that, is this idea of translating the faith into the, I mean, I try to do this with my kids, right? Translating the faith into language that they understand. And I think there's some broader principle at work there. People can, can come to know it in their own terms. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. It, I, I think that in any intellectual endeavor, religious or otherwise, that uh, the foundation of that exercise is a share is a, is a set of shared basic facts, yeah. right? And then the exercise is well, I interpret the facts this way, you may interpret them that way. Sure. But it seems to me what's going on is a uh, war on that yeah. in essence, where yeah. in fact we don't agree on basic facts anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess my question to you as a historian yeah. is is how do you how do you deal with that? How do, you, how do you bring people together who have lost the ability to agree on the most basic set of facts? Mm. This is a, a central problem. I, I, as a historian, I'll say it's not the first time that this has ever happened. Um, I mean, it's happening on a scale that's maybe new in the sense that Twitter wasn't around 100 years ago or something like that. Uh, well, but a hundred, you know, in the late 19th century, for example, I, I wrote a book about this period in Chicago, and, and, you know, you've got penny papers that have vastly ranging ideas of what's actually happening in the city, and rumors are flying, and, you know, so it's not that, um, there was a kind of, I think what's unusual is actually this moment that many of us came of age in, where there was a kind of, uh, around the kind of network news, a kind of shared moment, or a shared experience, and so there does feel to be a loss. But it's not the first time in history that we've had this sort of thing. Um, the digital piece is new, and so that's, that's uh, important. I mean, I, I, I would say this. I mean, I, I think I defer to some of my colleagues in sociology. I mean, I, I think about the work of someone like Robert Wuth now, who wrote this excellent book on uh, sort of the, the, de the decline of denominations, and this is a case in point for, for the problem that we're facing as a society. Uh, Wuth now writes that, you know, the it was the case that back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, when people went to the Methodist church because they were Methodists, or they went to the Lutheran church because they were Lutheran, that um, you ended up there with people you just on all sides of all sorts of questions, right? But what he traces is the emergence in the later part of the 20th century of a realignment of religious life and Christian life down political lines, such that we don't then meet, when we go to church, people that we disagree with, and, and then we have the emergence of these phones that pull us further into that world and further away from our neighbor. Um, I think this is maybe one of the pressing issues of our time, is figuring out how do we strengthen the ties that bind, um, especially just even in our own neighborhoods. Um, and it seems to me that that is the kind of project that lends itself actually to the empowerment of ordinary folks who can maybe not affect what's going on in Washington, D.C., but can gather people in their neighborhood whom they disagree with. And that seems to me to be a most promising small thing that a lot of people could be doing, and, and maybe to great dividends if, if people were to take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah, Catherine. I was interested more in this question of sort of how we should think about uh, missionary work. Yes. And this is something that Maria Early at Gettysburg Seminary struggles with too, mm -hmm. because again, there's a lot of both positive and yeah. negative yeah. legacies of missionary work. Absolutely. You have again this sort of cultural imperialism. On right. the other hand, um, people are sometimes very empowered right. by the by the right. uh, message and the support that missionaries provide. Yeah. And this is true both past and present. Mm -hmm. And Again, in Western culture, again, it's sort of even politically correct to sort of look down on missionaries. Mm -hmm. They know they're trying to oppose things, mm -hmm. whereas if you actually look at Native realities, mm -hmm. lots of Native cultures actually, you know, are welcoming of these outside ideas and influences, and yeah. they're sort of, I mean, they want to sort of judge them on their own, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, they don't want to be suppressed by them, but they're yeah. sort of eager for this interaction. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. how do we deal with this, both past and present? I mean, as you've said, and as I tried to indicate in the talk, I mean, it is a complicated story, right? And, and in some ways, it's an impossible one to generalize too broadly about. I think the thing that I would say is that um, historians have really followed the missiologists, I think, on, on this kind of 
all of a sudden realization of the ways in which world Christianity is changing and maybe some of the reasons why it's changing. Um, and I think, I think that that point, you know, the, the Maasai Creed is a good example of collaboration. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be either or, right? Missionaries are either all bad or all good. Um, that's an example of kind of a creative collabor collaborative thing that emerged out of uh, relationships between missionaries and, and local people. Um, I, I think that the, the thing that I'm trying to point out here and that I think is a broader trend in the literature is this question of who gets to say what Christianity is. And if, if the only people who get to participate in that conversation are the colonizer, um, that, that has had some real problematic outcomes. And I think what, um, it doesn't have to mean the total throw or expulsion of missionaries, but it does mean, at least at the very level, the ability to approach one another as fellow human beings and fellow believers who are equally part of the body of Christ and trying to work it out together. And that, when that pattern has emerged, I think it has redounded to the goodness of the, of the church in those, in those places. It's, you know, again, we could t probably talk about that all night and, and look at different examples in different places about the way these things have worked out. Um, so, yeah. Uh, do we have time for one? One more. One more. Okay, sure. Um, I listened to your story, and I and I, I thought the one you know, hero of your story, from the time of the Reformation to every positive thing you described, was God's word. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to maybe just pick your brain. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion about the place of God's word in the Lutheran Christian College? Mm hmm. Hmm. Huh? Any particular? I mean. What, what place does it have or, or something yeah, like that? Hmm. That's a good question. I would think a central place. Uh, I would think an important place. I mean, universities are uh, particular kinds of places with particular kinds of pursuits. I think about um, a beautiful expression of this by Otto Kretzmann in his inaugural address at Valparaiso University where he, a graduate of this, this very place, uh, had some very, very erudite things, I think, to say about this particular topic. In his inaugural address at Valparaiso, he talked about the university as a place where truth is pursued and truth is transmitted. And that's a, a big piece of what it is. As, as Christians and as Lutherans, um, Kretzmann was arguing that we need not be afraid of any idea. If we believe that in a truth, capital T, then the truth is not going to be toppled by conversation with someone we disagree with or with an idea that we aren't sure about, right? Um, and so I think universities are places where um, those kinds of conversations can and should happen. At the same time, Kretzmann's arguing that even if we don't have the fullness of the truth right now all the time, we do have uh, in Revelation and, and, in, and in the scriptures some sense of the truth. And we're uncompromising about that even as we enter into these conversations. And I think I'm not going to improve on the Otto Kretzmann answer to that question. Uh, I, if you haven't read his inaugural address at, at Valpo, it's, on, it's online. I highly, I think it's just, it's a beautiful text that I think remains highly relevant to Christian higher education. I mean, it's kind of amazing that, you know, who remembers a talk 60 or 70 years later? It's a talk worth remembering. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks all of you for joining us, provocative, prophetic, and prompting us to be reformers in the places where we find ourselves. Thank you. Have a great evening.